Hello and welcome. The 1914 amalgamation of the Northern and Southern Protectorates has over time been scrutinized and criticized by aggrieved ethnic groups and political observers in Nigeria as a marriage of unwilling partners. Of course, this followed agitations over reports of marginalization and underdevelopment of the regions of those criticizing or the agitators. Now, successive governments have gone through phases of national conferences and dialogue to seek and promote a united Nigeria. Still, the issues remain and even reoccur. On Fireworks Today, we'll revisit them as we set them against the nation's current realities and the popular calls for restructuring. Welcome to Fireworks on TVC. I am Bukola Samuel Wemimo. Let's take a moment. Welcome once again. My guest on the program today is the president of the Yoruba World Congress, Professor Banji Akitoi. Welcome to the program, sir. Thank you very much. It's good to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the most ideal place to start will be the mood of the polity, of course, with um, rising insecurity, um, the current rise in fuel price, and of course, the rise in the price of um, electricity tariff. So what would your immediate reaction be you know, to these developments? Yes, uh, you, you've mentioned current challenges, rising electricity, prices, rising food prices, uh, the fall in the, uh, in the value of the Naira, uh, etc., etc. Those are the surface, the surface only. Deeper is that the, the, the country itself is retrogressing fearfully in very many directions. Uh, and uh, people who watch the world are frightened by it by the picture of Nigeria today. Nigeria is the uh, home of extreme poverty in the world, the number one home of extreme poverty in the world. Uh, pundits who study the economy of the world are saying that in another 20 years from now, by 20, uh, in another 10 years from now, by, by 2030, more than 50% of all the poorest people in the world will be Nigerians. Uh, if things go on this way, it's, it's a horrifying prospect. Uh, yeah, that's the way we have brought ourselves. It need not have been like this. Uh, we started with a country with a great deal of resources, which is why the British have zeroed in on Nigeria, particularly on, in Africa. Uh, it is the reason for the amalgamation itself, uh, because the British saw that this is a country with a great deal of resources, and uh, that can be developed. The British will gain from it, but we ourselves will also gain from it. Uh, it, has not, it, it has not exactly worked like that. We have earned a lot of, of, of money from our resources, from uh, originally our uh, farm Pro, uh, produce like palm, palm oil, palm kernels, cocoa especially. Co we were one uh, of the largest cocoa producers in the world for some time. And that brought a lot of money to Nigeria. We were for some time the largest producer, of, uh, exporter of granite in the world uh, and so on. But we have, we have destroyed everything. Now we are not seriously regarded as a major cocoa exporter in the world. We are no longer a Grand Nut exporting country. The Grand Nut industry has perished. We are no longer seriously an oil, a palm oil producing or palm kernel exporting country in the world. Uh, yes, we see earn a lot of money from uh, mineral oil, from petroleum, but the, the, the assets are declining very fearfully. And uh, in any case, when you do a check of, uh, we, have, we have not very little to show for the huge amount of money that we have earned from oil. Uh, we have created the most fearfully corrupt, most resolutely corrupt country on earth. 
And uh, the world is wondering, can a country that has brought itself this far low ever be able to raise itself back up again? And for, for, with most people, the answer is no. But, but, but really, uh, your words are extreme. Horrid, uh, terrifying, the most corrupt destruction of um, agricultural potential. Uh, but aren't the efforts of um, you know, government uh, get towards salvaging the situation itself? For, mm. for example, the closure of the borders, um, uh, and and the likes, you those, know, the ban on the importation of certain those are certain, certain food crops that are, that can be grown those are at home, and the efforts to stabilize the value of the naira against the dollar. Those are cosmetics. We have now arrived at a point at which we are the most violent country on earth in time of uh, when there is no war. In peace time, the most violent country on earth. Now, uh, every day you open, sometimes one fears to open the papers in the morning or to watch television before going to bed. Because what you are going to be seeing is stories of, of marauders, bandits going around and killing people and destroying property and so on and so forth. That's what we have become in Nigeria. We have become a country in which there is going on now a war of all against all. It is terrifying. I grew up in this country. I loved to know my country. As a young undergraduate, I used to travel in the country and go to the north, go to Zaria, go to just, just go and play around, no, you know, nothing particular. Young, young boy wants to know his country. My Duguri everywhere, Enugu, etc. But I God, it is no longer so. Nigeria is as beautiful as, as ever, but Nigeria is not the beautiful country that we used to have. Uh, people are dying everywhere. I graduated from uh, Ibadan in 1961. And, uh, well, part of the story is that I got a job the before I finished my final paper in Trenchard Hall. And uh, my employer sent a vehicle to take me from uh, my exam to, uh, to my employment. Uh, that's the way it used to be. It's not only me. That's the way it was for us in our time. Uh, uh, and the first thing I wanted to do to, for my students as a history teacher was to take them to go to know, to know their country. And the kids were excited. I was only a little older than they were, you know. And they were excited. And so I selected about 25 kids. The principal gave us money to go and rent a lorry. Now, we, we didn't have buses in those days. Who had buses? Except perhaps Ojuku's, Odumego uh, uh, Ojuku's uh, buses and so on. Who, who, who talked about buses? We went and entered the lorry, a good condition lorry, and uh, we crowded into it and it took us from, uh, it took us around Nigeria to the north, to, to, to uh, Kaduna Kano, uh, back through Jaws and uh, Makodi to, 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 to Eastern Nigeria and back through Veneto. Listen, it was, no, uh, and there was not any notion, any fear that anything would hurt us on the way. We went, 25 young boys and their young teacher and the driver of the vehicle we went around Nigeria and nothing touched us anywhere. And there was not even the slightest fear in our hearts that anything could hurt us. That's the kind of world in which I grew up in. In, in Kaduna, we didn't have any appointment to see the premier. Our father, Sir Madu Bello, we never had any plan to see him. But, you paint, we, you paint but, a, you, but we went to the Ministry of Education. You, you paint a glorious picture. Yeah, that's the way it was. But this prevailing 
insecurity and perhaps economic downturn predates this administration. So, and, it is and much of the political class belong to your generation. No, it is not. So this I, I, in it's, that regard, I ask, what legacy has your generation bequeathed to the current Nigeria? Yeah, okay. My generation is the generation immediately after people like Sir Madhu Bello, uh, Chief of Bafemi uh, Dr. Namde Azikwe. That we are the people, we, we, they are direct sons. And... Uh, it is we who have educated. Nigeria is a considerably educated country, and it is my generation, the generation, you know, people will say, oh, we are the lost generation. It is not true. We have given a lot to this, to this country. We were the backbone of the universities that grew up in this country. We were the young people who emerged immediately after independence and gave the world the University of Ibadan in its strength. It had started before, but it was in our time that it became a great place. It is in our time that the Obafemi Awolo University became a great university. I was the first human being to sleep on the, to live on the campus of Obafemi Awolo University when it was being built. The university of authorities said we will we, we move, but most people were hesitant to go. Most of our seniors were hesitant to go. And on January 27, 1967, uh, I was the first, I was the first family to move into the campus. We gave that university a great thing. We developed some of the best academic programs ever known on the African continent in that university. So, and we were doing the same thing in Yusuka. We were doing the same thing in Zaria, our generation. We were... In 1982, when I was a senator, I was invited by the, uh, by the Institute of International Affairs of South Korea in, in, in Seoul to come and give a lecture on the, 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 the prospects of growing relationship between Nigeria and South, and South Korea. I was bragging for most of that lecture about my country, the things that we have done the type of universities that we had built, some of the best universities in the world, the best, some of the best medical schools, and, and so on. I was bragging. I had much to brag about. That was 1982. Besides what you have to brag about, how much of the problems prevalent today should your generation take responsibility for? It is the military people who wrecked this country essentially. They took over in 1960s. Six. And they took over and took over and took over. In the nine, in the uh, many years between 1966 and 1999, the military was, were the rulers. They were the people who determined what would happen. And uh, they have their, their, their legacy is a barbarous legacy. That's why Nigeria has plunged the way it has plunged. So, uh, yes. Uh, it's difficult to talk for me and for many people of my generation it's difficult to talk without becoming emotional about Nigeria we have seen the best thing we have held the best thing in our hand and we have seen it become almost nothing in our hands it is a shattering history it is a shattering history now we are killing one another every day, fiendishly, on a regular basis. People are, we are killing one another as if that is a national industry. And the world is wondering, what is happening in this place called Nigeria? I, I, I hear that among some of my colleagues, old retired professors like me in America, Recently, people were talking, why said uh, uh, Professor Akinte, why did he go back to that place? Uh, and so on. Shouldn't we contribute money to bring him back? He cannot be living there. Uh, one of them asked, is there a government in that country? And uh, one very old man then uh, answered, there isn't even a country in that country anymore. 
There isn't even a country, not to talk of a government. That's the attitude of the world. That's the perception of the world about Nigeria now. That's my country. The country. I used to travel a lot as a young man. I loved to travel. I represented Nigeria in, uh, the Nigerian students in conference after country, conference in Africa, in, in Europe, uh, in Asia, and so on, as an undergraduate. Then as a graduate, as a, uh, as, a, as a professor of history, and then director of African studies, I wanted to know the world. And I saw a lot of the world. Uh, and uh, one thing I always brought back when I was younger, when as an undergraduate I would go and represent uh, Nigeria in an international students' conference in Addis Ababa, in, uh, uh, in uh, East Africa, in uh, Nairobi, in uh, Germany, and uh, so on. I could see very clearly that my country was the promise for Africa. That it was the God-given duty and prospect of Nigeria to lead Africa out of barbarism, out of poverty, to the top of the mountains in the modern world. That's why I was, I couldn't resist giving my time and even abandoning my career. When Chief Abulo came out of uh, Calabar and came around and, uh, and the civil war was over, and he came around to our universities and said, come, let us go and build our country. We've had a terrible time. The war is always over. We can build our country. We can rebuild our country. We can fulfill its promise. That was Chief Awolowo. And we started the whole intellectual movement towards the unity party of Nigeria in, on the campus of Obafemi Awolowo University. Yeah, we were fired by a desire to make this country a great country. I used to, I used to love to come from the meetings in Ekana or Ibadan or Lagos to my, to my students in, in Ife and just go wild and just tell them, you know, what country we are going to build, what we are going to make of our country. Yes, yeah, the resources are there, the human, the human beings are there, the, and so on and so forth. And uh, between me and my students, we coined a phrase. We said, we are going to make Nigeria the black man's world power of modern times. No. It's not easy for me to be talking about it. We were going to make Nigeria the black man's world power of modern times. And what has Nigeria become now? Do you deny the efforts of this current political class to build Nigeria? Who? Who did? Who's, who has built Nigeria? Do you deny the current efforts? The what? To salvage this insecurity in the Northeast and in fact the entire what, North. How did we build? We built that. We created the, uh, the Boko Haram. It is the circumstances of our country that created Boko Haram. It is the circumstances of a country that has created the Fulani herdsmen and militias, and uh, with the ones you call the, the bandits and so on, killing people in, um, uh, every part, in every part of the north. It is the circumstances we have created. That's it. Everything leads to another thing. Everything comes from another thing. We built a country of violence, of hopeless people who go violent. That's it. There is, the, the, uh, uh, and the potential for more violence is here. The potential for more violence than we are seeing now is here. Yeah. What about Amoteku? It's a response to uh, the insecurity that is gaining in, uh, inroad into the southwest yes all these things are coming to the southwest day by day we were we, we, we were faced with yoruba men and women being killed on their farms and be on the way to their farms people being kidnapped and so on and so forth and uh, for a start people like me and uh, other leaders began to say well, you people defend your villages defend your farm so on. But do you know the potential behind that type of admonition? 
it means that Yoruba people who have a great deal of, of respect for human life and the dignity of life will become killers also. Is that how so, you see Amotepo? So we decided, no, we are not going to be asking our people to go out. We will create a well-ordered uh, agency that will handle it so that our people don't have to go looking around for people to kill and things like that. So we, the, uh, the Amateko is a deliberate Yoruba response to, uh, that, in, that uh, uh, wanted to create, the, the, the response was to create an ordered, civilized, well-trained little group that will do the work of defense so that the ordinary people do not go rampaging in the farm looking for Fulani who had killed, who had something. That's why we created it, a civilized response. I, I, was, I was very strongly connected with this. And on the day that they were launching it, I was there and I made a statement that oh, we thank you, our governors. We can't let, we can't ask, haven't spent, our parents spend all their resources on educating their children. Haven't spent all those resources educating our people, our young, our young people. We now unleash them to go into the bush to go and be killing people. No, it's better to have a decent little group, well trained, properly guided, properly led, who would defend. That's why I'm, I'm a tech who came into being. It's a civilized response. Do you worry about the sustainability of Amateko, particularly given the fact that? It's only become operationally known those states in, in terms of finances now. Yeah, it is big. there is a great deal of resistance to it. And that worries me, it scares me. If Yoruba people were to respond to the attempt to stymie Amatekon, to prevent it from operating, I don't know what the Yoruba people will do. I hope the, the attempt to stop Amatekon will we fizzle out soon so Amatekun can walk and protect the Yoruba homeland so that the Yoruba people themselves don't ar ar rise up in a If Amatekun can be sustained financially, should uh, any form of resistance be something to worry about? It is not the money. It's not the money. If the governments of, I mean, of the Western region, uh, of, of the Western, they call, they call it Western zone, I Western region? I don't use to zone. I, I'm used to Western region. <laughs> so, so if the governments of the Western region were to have difficulty financing Amatekun, and Amatekun is free, is left free, the government takes off, the federal government takes off its influence, in a, where it's, it's, it's uh, obstructing influence, and Amatekun can go on. Even if the, the, the state government had some difficulty, in financing the people of the Western region, we help. We ourselves we help. Yeah. So are you suggesting that the delaying takeoff in other parts of it the is, West yeah. is as a result of um, the leadership cowering in the face of political pressure from the center? I wouldn't go so far as to say they are cowering, but they are under the influence of their of the federal government. Every state in Nigeria, we don't have a we don't have a federation. All the power resides in Abuja. And no governor can defy Abuja and hope to be able to rule his state. It's not possible. Mm. So, um, given rising insecurity, the economic situation, current economic situation, and similar sundry issues, we are back to the same uh, place where Nigeria was and uh, where it... T t took a second look at the amalgamation of the Northern and Southern Protectorate. Are we back there again in 2020? In 2020, we have gone very far down from 2010. And 2010, we had gone far down than 2000. In 2000, we had gone far down from 1990. And so on, we've been going steadily down. So, so uh, but the important thing is we must look at uh, the amalgamation. It was a horrendous mistake. Sir Amadou Bele said the, the mistake of 1914. Yeah. 
And, I'm, I'm going to ask and, you if uh, the constitutional uh, recommendations made at the, the national confab uh, during the tenure of former president, good luck, Jonathan, and in, uh, in 2014, the, in 2014, mm. and subsequent recommendations by other committees have been sufficient. You're on to fireworks. My guest today is Professor Banji Akitoyi. We're looking at uh, current socioeconomic problems in the country and uh, perhaps uh, constitutional solutions to them. Stay with the program.